quick hit series. It's my pleasure to have back on the show, Dr. Olivia Ostro. Dr. Ostro is an academic clinician and the director of quality for the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children and an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. With her work in patient safety, she's developed a special interest in a relatively uncommon but life-threatening true emergency that unfortunately is on the rise, where super fast recognition and management is paramount. Can you guess what this pediatric emergency medicine topic is? Well, it's button battery ingestion. So those little disc-shaped batteries that we use for so many gadgets, from flashlights to car keys and even children's toys, You'll see this in children under the age of six years old, and the problem is that recognizing it can be really tricky because often no one sees the child ingesting that button battery. So welcome back to EM Cases, Dr. Ostro. It's awesome to have you back. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Um, delighted to be here and, and to talk about, as you said, a topic that's really become a growing interest of mine Button battery injuries are not only dangerous, but they are becoming more common. In fact, there's been a ninefold increase in button battery injuries in the last 20 years. In fact, we are looking at our data at Sick Kids, where I work, and we've actually had our highest number of button battery ingestions last year in 2022 with nine ingestions. I did mention at the top that button battery ingestions can be life threatening. And the first question is is why? Like, let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. Why is it so dangerous? Like what's going on when a four-year-old tries to swallow a button battery? So the lithium button batteries, those are becoming more common. And the increasing size and in, in as well as the voltage make children at risk for higher rates of injury due to impaction, particularly impaction in the proximal or middle part of the esophagus. Esophageal button battery impactions is really where the significant risk is. And then the risk tends to decrease if the battery makes it to the stomach and or beyond, but it's certainly important to still know how to manage. And so the way that it works is that it's it's a caustic injury, so not a thermal injury, and it leads to a chemical reaction causing an alkaline burn. So essentially, the mucosa of the tissues bridges the positive and negative terminal of the button battery to complete an electric circuit. And this current leads to water being hydrolyzed into hydroxide, which results in a rapid increase in tissue pH, leading to liquefactive necrosis. And this, their burn, this alkaline burn through, will burn through the esophagus, the trachea, and the major blood vessels. And this can lead to several complications, life-threatening injuries, and even death through things like a tracheal esophageal fistula or aorta esophageal fistula. Yeah, I mean, just listening to the potential badness that can occur from ingesting a button battery, it's kind of surprising that button batteries are so ubiquitous and can also cause so much damage and that you don't hear people talking about them in public too often. So that's just a little precursor to how we might end this quick hit in terms of what we can do from a wider societal perspective. Absolutely. Uh, Because we wouldn't be talking about this if button batteries weren't accessible to little kids. All right. So now that we have a little understanding of how the button battery eats through the esophagus and the trachea and the blood vessels when it's impacted in the esophagus, how is button battery ingestion likely to present to your ED? Because I imagine that many of these ingestions won't be seen by the parents. They won't be witnessed. And so you won't know necessarily that there is a button battery ingestion. So what are some of the clues clinically that might tweak you to thinking, okay, this is a button battery ingestion. Maybe I should get some imaging and and start managing this patient. That's a really important point. So symptoms can be very specific and they can be vague. So, you know, when we think about a foreign body ingestion in a child, there could be many types of ingestions and button batteries being one of them. You can think of a child with a choking event who then develops sort of that immediate cough, chest pain, wheezing. Those are going to be the textbook symptoms. But unfortunately, as you said, the symptoms don't always present that way and can be more vague. So sometimes you just have a child who's presenting with vomiting and usually more later findings and even after prior ingestion, you can see hematemesis. You can see a child presenting with decreased feeding, acute food refusal that's not really explained why, and and, and some respiratory symptoms and even described in the literature a fever. So you really need to have a high suspicion to have button battery ingestions on your differential diagnosis. 
Additionally, sometimes parents do witness a, an ingestion, but they're uncertain what the object is, or parents might often present saying that their child swallowed a coin. When I hear a child swallowing a coin, I always think that this could potentially be a button battery until proven otherwise. Great point. So when a parent comes in with a, a suspected object, including a coin, always keep in mind that that coin, we need to prove that it's not a button battery. And we'll talk about uh, how to use our x-rays to help us distinguish a coin versus a button battery. That's a great pearl. I love that because I have to be honest that when a parent tells me their child's ingested a coin, I just take it at face value and okay, they've ingested a coin, but that's that's a one that I imagine can get easily misinterpreted. And what about the timing of the onset of symptoms? I mean, my understanding is that this caustic chemical reaction that breaks down the tissue and causes severe burning, this can all happen very quickly, like within hours, but that it can also be delayed. So how about the timing? Can you tell us a little bit about the timing of, of the presentations and the onset of symptoms? So the timing of presentation after ingestion has a wide spectrum from a couple hours to, to several days. And a lot of that gets back to whether the ingestion was witnessed or not by parents. But what is important to know is that really the damage to tissue starts within two hours. And so we have used, as we started looking at the care that we provide at SickKids, we use that two-hour time frame as that critical window. If we can remove the button battery within that time frame, the risk of, of severe and fatal injury dramatically decreases. But the literature really supports that the risk for more severe injury and death tends to occur after a 12 hours of, of ingestion. And that's because after 12 hours, we know there's an increased risk of perforation. Okay, so time is esophagus, time is life of the child. I want to talk about first what you can do in the emergency department, what you need to do in the emergency department for a suspected button battery ingestion. So there's imaging, and then there's some initial treatments that we can give and I imagine that you want to get the imaging done and give your initial treatments in parallel as soon as possible. So can you just give us a sense of how you would manage a patient, let's say a three-year-old, um, let's say it's a known button battery ingestion. They come in, let's say they had a choking episode and they're refusing to eat and they have some chest pain and the parents said, oh, they just ingested the button battery an hour and a half ago. So what do you actually do in the emergency department for these kids? So it's important to have a plan in place. If you have a child who comes in with a witness known button battery ingestion, there are several steps that should be taken simultaneously. First is to think about giving the child a neutralizing agent, such as sulcrophate or pasteurized honey, immediately so it can reduce the pH and coat the battery to delay the battery discharge and subsequent alkaline burns to tissue. If you have honey, only honey available, the recommended dose is two teaspoons or 10 milliliters of honey. You can give up to six doses, 10 minutes apart for each dose. It's important to note that if you're going to give honey or sulcrophate, it must be under 12 hours. And the reason being for this is that we know that the risk of perforation increases after 12 hours. You also must be ensured that there's no concerns for an acute airway, so the child must be able to swallow. In an emergency room, ideally in a, in a hospital setting, you have sulcrophate available. And so sulcrophate would be the drug of choice if immediately available with one gram or 10 milliliters every 10 minutes up to three doses. So in a healthcare setting, if you have sulcrophate immediately available, this should be your first choice. If not, honey is a great second option and something parents can also be delivering to their child en route to the emergency room. Again, if the child can safely swallow or something that EMS can also deliver to a child en route to an emergency room. All right, so just to review there, it's either sucralfate, one gram every 10 minutes for a maximum of three doses, or pasteurized honey, two teaspoons or 10 mils, again, every 10 minutes for a total of six doses, but you have to be sure that the ingestion was within 12 hours and that there's no airway issues that they can actually swallow the stuff. That's correct. Got it, okay. And besides the sucralfate or honey, what else can we do for these patients in the ED until they get definitive management in the OR if, if it is impacted in the esophagus? In parallel, you want to have a mechanism in place so the child can receive a STAT, AP, and lateral X-ray that includes the neck and the chest to look for the, the site of the battery. What you're looking for on the X-ray 
is what's called the halo sign on the AP and the step-off sign on the lateral on the lateral X-ray. And these are pathognomonic for a button battery and can help you distinguish from a coin. All right, let's go over those. So the halo sign for the AP and the step-off sign for the lateral X-ray. Can you just try and describe those? And we'll have some pictures in the show notes to yeah, go along with sh- that. For sure. Pictures are really helpful to take a look at so you know to recognize it. But the halo sign really has this outer ring type presence that you will see on the disc battery that you would not see present on a coin. And then on the lateral sign, on the lateral x-ray, you will see the step off sign. I would describe the step off as an interrupted circle where you're seeing sort of a step or a wedge moving into the circle that doesn't keep, keep it a completely circular, sh- perfectly circular shape as you would expect. So again, the halo sign on x-ray is on the AP, and you'll see sort of a ring within a ring, so two rings rather than one, that looks like a halo. And then on the lateral x-ray, you'll see the step-off sign, which is sort of like a wedge taken out of a circle. That's correct. And it can be very subtle. So you really want to zoom in uh, when you're looking at these images so that you can find them. And again, if you're not certain, have that high index of suspicion, reach out to your local radiologist or another colleague to take a look at that film with you. Okay, great. So let's say you've identified the button battery in the esophagus. It's time for lights and sirens and getting your pediatric tertiary care center on the phone for endoscopic removal of the battery. But let's say the battery looks like it's passed through the esophagus into the stomach or the duodenum. How does that change your management? Yeah, it's a great question, and and this area has been a bit more controversial on how we manage batteries that are distal to the lower esophageal junction, so in the stomach and and beyond. And really, it comes down to the patient's age and the size of the battery. So if a child is younger than five years, or the battery is greater than 20 millimeters or larger, then really urgent removal is recommended. But otherwise, for older children or for smaller size batteries, often uh, these patients can wait and sort of observe uh, to see if any symptoms develop. And a lot of times these patients will pass the battery on their own within their stool. And then if the battery does not pass or symptoms were to develop before the battery passing, then the parent should be instructed what to look out for and when to return to your emergency room for repeat imaging. It's really important to have a plan in place in your local emergency department of how you're going to handle a child that comes in with a button battery ingestion. Because as we talked about, timing is everything, and that window of two hours is really, really critical. So in secondary prevention and and really aligning with high reliability principles in patient safety where we have that preoccupation with failure, it's important to know what will our emergency room's plan be to ensure this child has endoscopic removal of this battery as quickly as possible. So depending on your centers, your plan may vary. In some centers, that might be your local ENT colleagues or your gastroenterology colleagues who can remove the button battery for you. But in other centers, that is not feasible and they need to go to a pediatric tertiary care center. And critical in doing that, everything in parallel should be notifying that tertiary care center that you're sending a child to them that has a button battery impaction, again, to limit time delays, because we know the time that it takes to get an operating room prepared, to have an operating room available, and to get all the people required in to get that battery removed in in an OR. And so the more that we can prepare our teams and prepare our different facilities that we need to help, that will help limit the, the amount of time of the impaction. So that might involve calling an advanced transport team who can assist with getting a child to a higher level of care more quickly. Or sometimes, depending on where you live, the fastest mechanism is to have the parent drive their stable child to that tertiary care center. So again, it's really about knowing how are we going to manage these in advance so when they do occur, that plan can be carried out as quickly as possible. It would probably be prudent for most hospitals to develop a button battery ingestion protocol so that these things can happen quickly. So you're not trying to guess, oh, should it be ENT or should it be gastroenterology or or do I need to transfer this patient out? Or you just have a protocol with a checklist, advanced directives for x-ray, et cetera, and you can get that patient to definitive care faster. Exactly. All right. Dr. Ostro, anything else you wanted to add about what we need to know about button battery ingestions? I think it's important to recognize that injuries can be ongoing even after the button battery is removed. So symptoms can develop weeks to months after a button battery has been removed. 
And that's because ongoing injury can still occur in the esophagus. So children are, are closely monitored at home for two months of delayed complications that could present at your local emergency department with recurrent vomiting, hematemesis, acute airway concerns. If any of those uh, symptoms are present in a child that has a history of a recent button battery ingestion in the last couple months, think about a complication from that button battery ingestion. Wow. Even after it's been removed, you can still burn through your esophagus. Unfortunately, yes. There are reports and we've seen cases of these severe outcomes. So we've talked about recognizing these patients that can be sometimes tricky. We've talked about the ED management and some of the things that you could do in your institution to help facilitate getting these kids taken care of faster. What do you think the best way to avoid button battery ingestion in the first place is? It's really important as healthcare providers that we counsel and empower families with young children about how to safely use, store, and discard of batteries to prevent these devastating injuries. As you said, button batteries are really found in many household items. And I think many people would be surprised to see how many of the items they have in their house currently have them. So we think about, for sure, many children's toys have batteries but really also everyday items like our watches, our car keys, calculators. Button batteries are commonly in in hearing aids. So simple tips such as storing batteries out of reach and sight, taping batteries with duct tape or packing tape prior to disposal, and using drop-off depots can prevent children from being injured from these button batteries. So it sounds like uh, some public education, maybe some policy around alternatives to using button batteries in children's toys, especially that seems like kind of a no-brainer. Yes. uh, That we really shouldn't be using button batteries in children's toys at all. But I'll leave that up to uh, the powers that be. Anything we can do to prevent these injuries is critical. And so you're absolutely right that advocacy is essential. As healthcare workers, we advocate for patients' health on a daily basis, and we never want to see a patient suffer from a preventable injury. Just last year, the United States passed Reese's Law, which requires the Consumer Product Safety Commission to require child-resistant closures on products that use these button batteries and also include more stringent warning labels on all packaging. Australia has similar laws as well. Canada currently does not. All right, so we've got some work to do. Thanks so much, Dr. Ostro, for your insights into button battery ingestions. It's certainly going to be on my radar for the kitty who comes in with some vague symptoms. <laughs>